Cool fight scenes are fun to watch. Not all fight scenes are cool, and not all fight scenes are fun to watch. So how do you make something cool and also fun to watch? I have seen a lot of tutorials talking about how to improve your animation or certain and specific moves, but the way I look at it, there are two things you need to understand. One is you need to develop a better understanding of how cool works, meaning you don't need to look at animation like a formula. The formula is built into your head. Instead of solving a math problem while you have to physically strain your head to figure out the answer, it's like poetry, words that just spill out from the heart. And two, you need to train your mentality. Personally, when I animate, I listen to music. Pretty sure I have some public playlists if you want some badass songs to listen to. But my brain seems to tune out everything else and just pay attention to the music more than what I'm actually animating. I call it entering the flow, where you're just having fun animating and vibing. I don't know how most people animate, but if you turn everything off so you could focus and you're constantly wondering what the playback is going to look like and constantly playing your animation and rewatching it at every 5 to 10 frames to look for the bad, in my opinion, that's a terrible way to animate. Let's look at it this way. When you walk into the bathroom and look in the mirror and you see your face, sometimes you see too much of your face. Sometimes you don't like what's on the other side of the mirror and you spend too long trying to figure out how to make it look good. When you look at your own face, similarly to looking at your own animation, you see the flaws. You've watched it over and over again and you're the one tweaking every keyframe. No one else will see the animation the same way you do. And there may seem like there's something off about it to you. You may ask for feedback, but you don't learn as much as you want to. Most likely because people tell you how they would handle it, or how you pose a certain move that you were trying to do. I want to try and help in a different way than just telling you how to pose a kick or how to how to pose a punch or I want to try and get to the root so how do you improve well for one you stop looking in the mirror so much stop just constantly replaying your animation get some really awesome music to listen to or maybe put on something funny and just come up with something don't worry if your instinct is telling you it's going to look like garbage your instinct can shove it Enter the zone and enter the flow and just create stuff. How can you think cool and make cool things if you don't even believe you're cool? For one, you're awesome, so get used to it. And two, when you look at your animation, don't be riding on that sinking feeling that the animation is going to be garbage or something. Although it's okay to see something you want to change and go back and fix it, it's incredibly hard to make something perfect on the first try, even in animation. But sometimes you just see too much wrong. You want to change the whole thing instead of just giving it a chance. It could look good if you keep going or maybe you just need some effects or sound effects. It's important to know the line between what you need to change and what you just think is bad. For that, it's simple. Be happy with what you come up with. Be aware that on the stairway to making cool stuff, you take larger steps with a good attitude. A half controversial topic is with every animation you work on, you get better. Now this doesn't always seem like the case, you may think that your animation from three projects ago is better than your current one, and therefore you don't believe the statement, you get better with every project. However, I'm here to tell you to suck it up, because that isn't true. Going through everybody's lists of favorite Montium fight scenes, most people prefer the red trailer to anything else in Ruby, or any of the other trailers for that matter, to anything else in Ruby. It's not because Monty got worse, it's because of the situations, the headspace they were in. Don't fault yourself for having less time or even having less of a cool concept. Personally, I think that the Red vs. Blue highway fight is my favorite uh, fight scene in all of Red vs. Blue, and it's not because that Monty got worse in Season 10, it's because I like the concept of fighting on the back of a, a truck with a one-take camera that doesn't cut, it just pans over everywhere, the situation with people with jetpacks flying around shooting everything all the time, it's, it's just a really cool concept. And even though Dead Fantasy was animated, like, years before Ruby or Red vs. Blue, I still like watching Dead Fantasy more than either of those. And it's not because Monty got worse. I definitely can see the improvements in the animation since Dead Fantasy, but the situation and the action, everything put together, I just enjoy watching it more. Your favorite doesn't have to be your most current. And if you think your animation quality is just plain getting worse, you may just not be enjoying it. Or you may have pushed yourself during a burnout. 
or maybe you're just not in a workflow suited for you. Everyone has burnouts, everyone has moments where their mind can't be creative and has to take a break from it. Even if you really do want to animate, your mind may not let you. Don't fault yourself for that. Alright, therapy session over. Now I want to explain a few things that make animation cool so you can understand it better. I want to share this as an interesting way of looking at something. If you were to circle every character in a fight scene and watch the circle's movements, does it make sense? Can you tell what's going on just by watching the circles? Let's see. This is just a small section of one of the many fights Montiel had done, and I asked people which Montiel animation this was from. People seem to be able to study the circles to find out it was a 2v2. Somehow people put together that it was from Red vs. Blue. Some people actually got it perfectly spot on, just from watching circles manage to find out exactly what was going on. For how difficult it seems this would be, some people have gotten incredibly close and also guessed it correctly. At the very least, they know the premise and situation in the fight. Now, what would happen if you circled every character in one of your fight scenes? Would it make sense as to what was going on? I had a friend to ask for some feedback on an animation recently, and he gave me the permission to use his video in my tutorial as an example. I did the same thing I did with the highway fight and circled every character. Does the movement of the circles make sense this time? I asked people and they said they couldn't understand what was going on, or explain the premise. Here's the actual animation. Now obviously you shouldn't have to understand everything from circles, I'd be surprised if anyone did, but it helps a lot and proves you are good with cinematography. If people can understand the premise purely based on circles, it means your animation is easy to follow and you understand the rules of the camera. Part of the reason Monty's was so easy to follow was because he did an amazing job with the camera revolving around the situation. The camera doesn't focus on one character, but the situation in general. When the camera spins around, it keeps the main characters in the middle of the screen, and when the characters move, the camera keeps up with them, making sure that, for the most part, they don't stray too far from the frame they are in. I noticed it while editing the animation. There was a lot of times where I didn't really have to move the circle at all, even when the characters were moving. They weren't, they weren't spastically changing where they are in the frame. When Carolina is doing the backflip slow motion dodge, the camera spins around her but keeps her exactly in the same spot on the screen. I didn't really have to move the circle that much. Comparing that with this shot, the character does a spin attack mid-air but I had to adjust the circle by a large amount every single frame because the character didn't stay in the same frame it was supposed to. In the end, the circle ended up spastically all over the screen. When this girl is running towards the fight, the camera seems to be pointed off to the side instead of getting both of the characters in shot. The camera seems to move and jerk in the direction of the certain attacks thrown to try and add more impact, but it almost seems more like the camera is confused than understanding what's going on. The camera should have a clear and smooth path focusing on the fight. When a character moves from the position it was in in the frame, it should make sense. For example, they get hit and they move closer to the end of the frame. The most important part of the shot is the middle. In all these fights, the middle is where your eyes are drawn. When there are two people on either side of the frame, their punches land in the middle of the frame. To drive it home the fact that Carolina wields this new weapon, the camera is viewing the weapon in the middle so you make sure you are aware it changes the fight. If York had thrown the gun to Carolina from the background instead of the foreground and the camera stayed focused directly on Carolina and the ODST instead of the gun, people would wonder where the gun came from as it was not properly introduced. The same thing is done here. If a character is in the center of the frame during a fight, there are a few things it could mean. They could be shown in the center frame if they are winning the fight, or they are knocked down and in the center of the frame to bring home their elimination. Or they are doing something different that may change the plot of the fight, and yes, a fight has plot. Some people seem to forget that. You can kind of think of it as King of the Hill. Every character is fighting for the center of the frame, but whenever conflict comes in, the camera gives half of its attention to that character. So with the camera half focusing on one character, they both try and fight for the camera's full attention. Sometimes one character does something different, like a really cool move that deserves full attention. A shot where only that character is in frame. Let's call them anticipation inserts. Notice how in these examples, the one character is the main focus to put emphasis on how hard their next hit is going to be.
Most of the time there is only one anticipation insert, but sometimes there seems to be a combo of inserts, such as when Ruby was doing her final murder fest on like 30 Beowulves at once, and when Yang had some of her Goldilocks stolen. These mass amounts of inserts are there to show just how powerful this next hit is going to be. The more inserts there are, the more build up there is for the final strike, like a bar slowly getting filled up until it's full. And in all of these moments, the camera gives its full attention to the character doing something cool, because the camera finds it impressive. Obviously, there are also normal insert shots. Normal insert shots being short close-up shots on a character or important object. Insert shots can be used to show the faces of a character to add more emotion to the fight, as well as understanding how the character reacts to certain moves. It can also give a short little break for the audience's brain to catch up with what they are seeing. Sometimes when a character is winning the fight, they are at the center of the frame to show that they are currently the king of the metaphorical camera hill. All of the other characters in the fight must then fight to knock them out of the center frame. Here's an example. Tifa leads the fight going up against multiple people at once, but stays in the center frame to show that Tifa is taking the lead in this fight. Although at the end of the fight, Tifa is dethroned as the king of the camera hill. In the yellow trailer we see in Yang's earlier fight against all the goons, she stays in the middle frame the whole time proving that Yang is simply on a level they cannot attain. Especially DJ Bear. Rip DJ Bear. You'll get his revenge one day. Usually these types of shots are done when one experienced fighter is going up against multiple less experienced fighters. And it could be useful for you to be aware of it so in the future you could be more intentional with how you place your camera and set up a fight. Ultimately and hopefully this knowledge will help you better understand how to make your fights more filled with anticipation and impact. Understanding the center frame and insert shots are very important as I hardly ever see new animators utilizing anticipation inserts or just insert shots in general. Before I move on, I just want to point out one other reason something could be in center frame, or require the camera's full attention all the time. Sometimes a character or object is in the center frame because it impacts the plot of a fight, or is foreshadowing to when it will impact the plot of a fight. Here are some examples. All of these shots are important. The camera needs to pay attention to these moments because it introduces something different to the fight. In this scene, the camera focuses on the two bottles, keeping them in the center frame to show their importance. And the characters fighting for them proves that whatever is in the bottle will in fact change the fight. Foreshadowing shots are optional. However, it adds more anticipation and ties everything together in the end when the new element is added. Notice here how we see Pyrrha getting ready for combat, while at the same time showing us short flashes of what's about to happen, kind of like a flash forward. It's getting us prepared for the fight, and also hyping us up with anticipation. If you have two evenly matched people or teams preparing to fight, your camera must spend equal time on both of them in order for the match to seem like they're actually both equal. If you show one character getting ready to fight, you should also show the other character preparing to fight as well. In Dead Fantasy 2, watches the camera cuts to one team getting ready to fight, then cuts to the other team getting ready to fight, then continues to cut back and forth to show that both teams are equal in power. If one team happens to have less of those shots, it would equate to them having less anticipation than the other team, and it would look like the other team is supposed to win. Take this scene in Dead Fantasy 2 for example when the odds were favoring one team. They were shown more pre-battle shots which led to the other team feeling weaker because the camera didn't spend as much time on them. This was done on purpose to drive home the fact that the dead or alive team was about to get their ass kicked. Let me know if any of this is getting through to you guys because the main thing I want you guys to get out of this is the ability to look at a film and instead of wondering how they did what they did or feeling like your work could never compare to it. I want you to understand it. 
maybe not fully understand why they decided to animate what they animated, or what was going through their mind, but understand why what they created was cool. Many people will look at a piece from an animator they look up to, and watching it instantly puts them down. If that mindset were a crime, I'd probably be a prime suspect not too long ago. Personally, I would look at an animation I look up to and think, Nothing I make will ever be this good. I'm insignificant compared to these people. I can't even understand the imagination that they must have had in order to come up with something like this. It was insane to me, and just upon watching something that good, instead of gaining motivation to create and eventually reach that level of understanding, it would demotivate me, because I would be comparing myself. I would be basing my expectations off of someone who has far more experience than me. But as a beginner, or even someone who has been doing it for a while but can't seem to grasp the idea, you have to eventually learn that before you learn to control your animations, you have to learn to control yourself. Nothing will demotivate you but you. Nothing will convince you your work is pointless but you. You yourself are the main reason your animation feels bad. Because I believe you do have the skills. I believe everyone has the capability to learn and accomplish what they were going for. You see so many heartwarming stories of people starting with zero knowledge and the worst mindset possible and still finding some way to succeed in the path they choose, whether it be someone or something. At some point in my life, creating animations wasn't even a thought in my head. At some point, everyone who has ever succeeded had an idea. It wasn't a select few who ended up lucky enough to succeed, it was the people who worked hard enough to succeed. If you truly do love animation or film, or anything else, and you want to do it, then I urge you to look at it as your work, not your hobby. It may be possible that the reason you view it as your hobby in the first place is because you don't have enough confidence in yourself that it will work out. In my opinion, your tears come from the heart, not your mind. Your greatest decisions and emotions come from the heart. If you look at your heart like it's half of your brain, it would be the good half, and the mind would be the evil half. So when you work, put your heart into it, not your mind. The more you think on something, the less likely you are to get it done. This applies to most things. Sometimes you just gotta stop thinking, stop staring at the situation and letting your mind run, and just start doing. If you stare over the edge of a cliff to the water 50 feet below you, the only thing that will go through your mind are the reasons why you shouldn't. But then, when you find yourself on the water after you jump, you realize all the time spent worrying was a waste. Your mind was trying to keep risk out of your mind, but life is all about risk. All of your best decisions are risks. Animation is not something that should scare you. Even if you want to become a good animator, it may intimidate you. This is because you are thinking too much about the outcome before you even start. You wonder if you'll ever be able to top your last project. Maybe you are entering a competition and you wonder if you can make it to the top or even end up on the leaderboard, and it scares you. Maybe you think too much about the other people entering the contest. Panicking will get you nowhere. Panicking will only hinder yourself. Learn to let your heart animate, not your mind. It may sound cheesy, but it's true. When I animate, my mind is never really focused on it. My mind is usually focused on the lyrics of a song playing, or thinking about a distant memory, or a cool scene from a movie or show, like Eddie playing the Master of Puppets by Metallica in the new Stranger Things season. And there have been times during a burnout when my heart isn't in it anymore, and instead of relaxing, I just try to use my brain to continue animating. But when I use my brain, all it ever does is worry about the process, thinking of animation as a math problem instead of poetry, and believing nothing I make is cool. In the end, I come up with a terrible animation and a worse attitude. And now the burnout lasts even longer. Speaking of burnouts, yeah, burnouts are definitely the worst part of this whole thing for me. But I believe I have figured out a way to stop them, or at least further the distance between how often burnouts happen. Right now, you have a motivation meter. It may be 100% or 50% right now. If you're watching an animation tutorial, I'm guessing it's got to be pretty low, or at least it was when you started watching. With seeing all those Jackie Chan quotes and Bruce Lee quotes, I'm sure you're excited to get back to work, right? Well, the point is, when you work, your motivation meter gradually decreases naturally. Similarly to a stamina bar in a video game, when you run out of stamina, you get a red bar, and you're penalized for running out. And now you have to wait longer for your stamina to come back because you let it reach 0%. But if you had stopped running before the bar reached zero, your stamina would start to rise quicker, and then you'd be able to run again fairly soon. This is how your motivation works. If you let the bar reach zero, it causes a burnout, and you have to wait longer before your motivation starts to rise again. Your motivation bar depletes faster or slower depending on your discipline. But I urge everyone here to avoid burnouts by doing one simple thing. Walking away from your animation while you still feel the urge to animate. 
If you fall asleep that night excited to animate the next day, proud of what you came up with that day, that means your motivation meter is also rising too. As long as every time you stop you still want to continue, that means you are doing it right. Obviously you still get burnouts, that's normal, it just means you need more discipline. Speaking of discipline, how do you gain more discipline? Well, for one, you don't really do that exclusively in your animation life. You gradually gain more discipline by stepping outside your comfort zone in all aspects of your life. Making hard decisions, sticking to something, and completing it no matter what, whether you go to the gym and complete a workout, or you say you're going to finish something by a deadline and push yourself to do so. In animation, stepping outside your comfort zone would be trying to animate something you've never done before. Maybe more flips? Maybe better camera movement. Maybe you suck at animating hand-to-hand -hand combat. Just try it. Make something you're unfamiliar with. Become comfortable in uncomfortability. I know this doesn't even feel like an animation tutorial anymore, and you're right, it really isn't. I told you that I wanted to get to the root of the problem, and the root of the problem hardly lies in your animation. Most of it lies in your mindset. Whether or not you are aware of how to animate is useless if you don't use that knowledge. You can have potential and still go nowhere if you are lazy, I've seen it before. And even if you are terrible at animation right now, do you know how much quicker you'll improve if you just stay positive and have fun with it? If you just calm down, believe in yourself, and keep moving forward, and surround yourself with a community that will help you and love your work, I'm sure you will see improvements. If not, then make improvements. Nothing is impossible. Sorry this ended up turning into a pep talk, but I feel like someone out there needed to hear it. And I feel like I needed to write it. I might go over more in the future and go further into detail on how things are that aren't exactly ph philosophical, but for now I will leave it off here. And with that, I have a Patreon if you guys want to support me. Link is in the description or the bio of my YouTube channel if you want to practice discipline and take the long route. You could do that as well. But... Thank you guys for watching, and uh, I'll see you guys at some point.